An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno, <clears throat> Lecture 13, July 8th, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me that the best way to demonstrate the specific difficulties which dialectic presents and what I have called the challenge of dialectical thinking, now that I have initially illustrated this challenge for you with a few models regarding the question of first principles, would be to confront really dialectical thinking with the classical rules of the game, which we may claim to a considerable extent have undoubtedly underpinned scientific thought to this very day. And without questions, these and without question, these are the four rules which can be found at the beginning of Descartes' Discourse de la méthode. <clears throat> Now you may say that we are already talking here about an essentially rationalist form of philosophy, but I am not particularly interested at this point in exploring the question of rationalism versus empiricism, a question which also implicitly arises in connection with the four Cartesian rules. Rather, I would like to talk to you here about these Cartesian rules in terms of the spirit of scientific method generally. For which, as I would ask you for the moment to accept, they are crucial far beyond the context of specific differences between rival schools of philosophy. <clears throat> I might also just point out in this connection that the very distinction between rationalism and empiricism is by no means as rigid as it tends to appear in the context of standard examination questions, for example. For if you read Bacon and Descartes together, you will find whole tracts of text where you would not easily be able to tell which of the two was the author. And this is because the spirit of science itself is here revealed far more emphatically than the spirit of any particular philosophical school. And indeed the spirit of science is, principally speaking, the spirit of method. The famous Cartesian demand, which furnishes the first of his rules, is the demand for clara e distincta perceptio, that is for clear and perspicuous, or better, distinct perception or cognition, when Descartes formula is specifically intended to apply to all possible objects of knowledge. For at this point, Descartes does not make any distinction, for example, between the things of sense perception and mental representations, or the intellectual realm in general. For the thought expressed here refers in an extraordinarily broad sense to all objective knowledge as such. I shall just read out the formulation precisely as he presents it. First of all, Descartes traces his rules back to a certain resolution or decision, which he tells us he had already made. And as the multiplicity of laws often furnishes excuses for evil doing, and as a state is hence much better ruled, when having but very few laws, these are most strictly observed. So instead of the great number of precepts of which logic is composed, I believe that I should find the four, which I shall state quite sufficient, provided that I adhered to a firm and constant resolve never on any single occasion to fail in their observance. I would immediately draw your attention to the role which is played by resolve here, by an act of will, by what later philosophy would describe as subjective pos positing. These rules in their entirety are concerned more with ensuring that we proceed vigor uh, rigorously in the spirit of mastering nature and that we deploy our intellectual powers in an internally rigorous and coherent manner than they are with allowing thought for its part to respond to its object, to the matter itself. And it actually seems to me that the defining characteristic of rationalism is much more readily to be discovered here than it is in the usual and vulgar distinction between rational and sensuous forms of knowledge. You can already see here that the central thought is that method is essentially determined by the will to, to establish order in a rigorous manner through the exercise of our mental capacities, and where by contrast the thought of passivity, the thought of responding and cleaving to the matter itself, proceeds from view in a rather remarkable fashion. And if I may anticipate for a moment, one could say that dialectic is ultimately the attempt in a manner that also effectively corresponds to rationalism and the rationalist tradition 
to release the power of rigorous thought itself, but to do so in a way that may also bind the power by confronting it with the essence of the objects to which our cognition actually relates. That would be the key difference at issue here. With regard to the rules he had decided upon, Descartes writes, the first of these was to accept nothing as true which I did not clearly recognize to be so, that is to say, carefully to avoid precipitation and prejudice in judgments, and to accept in them nothing more than what was presented to my mind so clearly and distinctly that I could have no occasion to doubt it. Now, if anyone were to ask you in general terms what the sciences which you pursue effectively require of you, I believe you would come up with something not so different from this. And I am certainly far from wishing to belittle the significant, significant motivations that are implicit in this fundamental Cartesian principle, namely those which are directed against the merely dogmatic acceptance of things, which I have not been able to recognize for myself as an autonomous thinking human being. Thus, when it is said that I should try to set aside all prejudices, this is of course also clearly directed against the theological authority which has been exercised over human claims to knowledge and appeals to certain dogmatically defined propositions without ever submitting these propositions themselves to any rational reflection. The expression precipitation, I might observe in passing, is also very characteristic of this form of thinking. I should not think in a precipitate, pre precipitate kind of way, that is, I should allow myself time in this regard. An eminent an eminently bourgeois perspective this, one which still found expression in Keller's remark, the truth will not run away from us. But I should also like to point out that there is much more involved here than can immediately be seen in these apparently innocuous words, which already basically imply that truth and time are not supposed to have anything to do with one another. I am supposed to think without precipitation, that is to say, I should calmly carry on thinking until the timeless core of truth presents itself to me. This does not involve the thought that truth itself could have something like its own time, its own tempo, something that is also required of me. Although any thinking person knows that thoughts actually do have a tempo of their own, that it is very difficult to combine certain kinds of extension or elaboration of thought with the intensity of thinking, nor does it involve the audacious thought that thinking itself may not be able in an essential and constitutive sense. To allow itself any time in this way, that it must be precipitate, precipitate, precisely because it must happen now, or as someone once said, only a hundred years hence. I only mention these things here to remind you that with major philosophers such as Descartes, and naturally, this is especially true of Hegel, we often come across formulations which seem so self-evident that we simply read past them, but which actually involve infinitely more if we only grasp them in terms of their specific difference. That is, when we are able to recognize the particular significance they possess precisely within the structure of thought in question, and which often lends them a quite different power and a quite different intention than the case if we just read them as are without already relating them to the heart of the thought to which they intrinsically belong. In the study of philosophy itself, we also discover, as I have tried to show you with respect to dialectic in general, that you can really understand the individual moments only if you really understand the whole, that you can therefore understand something like this Cartesian rule in the deeper sense only when you already recognize the pathos, and also above all when you appreciate the polemical import of Cartesian philosophy as a whole. But if we just simply read such propositions as we just simply read something without presuppositions merely in order to understand it, we cannot actually understand anything. For with regard to philosophy, and I am almost tempted to say with regard to anything whatsoever, there is actually no such thing as presuppositionless knowledge, and I cannot help pointing out to you that we have therefore already to some extent done violence to the proposition that I have just read out to you, for it naturally already involves a certain prejudice for its own part. The good Descartes would be horrified to hear the way 
in which I am encouraging you to interpret his work, and would say that he wishes to be understood purely in terms of the order of his thoughts, just as he presents them to us, and that to import anything else into them would actually be a case of prejudice. Nonetheless, these formulations about avoiding precipitation or prejudice cannot be understood in philosophical terms unless you also hear the whole of Descartes in mind. And I would say that the whole art of philosophical understanding and philosophical reading consists in this, that you do not simply read what lies written in front of you, although you must, of course, do that, but also learn to read what is written precisely in its own specific gravity, as it were. Thus, if you read the opening of Spinoza's Ethics and the definitions he provides there with the conviction which Spinoza along with the other rationalists specifically encourages in you, namely that you need only to grasp these definitions in order to unfold the whole of the ethics in a purely deductive process, then you will probably find, if you are honest with yourselves, that these definitions of substance, mode, attribute, etc. also strike you as exceedingly arbitrary and that you do not really know what is at stake here. But if you consider this definition of substance which stands at the beginning and are able to relate it to the original context where Descartes' doctrine of the two fundamental substances had already given rise to innumerable difficulties, where it no longer seemed possible to assume that these two substances could even interact with one another. In other words, that what we are really dealing with now is an attempt through the power of ratio to reunify a world which had been broken apart into the inner and the outer through the exercise of philosophical reflection. Then this knowledge will also allow these definitions which you encounter at the beginning to assume a completely different meaning. But I would just like to add in connection with the famous Cartesian definition we have been discussing that clear knowledge here means that the object itself is completely evident to you, that something is evident Evidemment, such and such as he says. In other words, it means that the state of affairs with regard to which you pronounce a judgment is truly so, that it stands immediately before your eyes without your having to rely here upon anything other than that which presents itself to you with such uncontaminated evidence, while all knowledge that is distinct, as the term is usually translated, refers to the precise difference of the object which you have before your eyes with respect to any other object. If I have already emphatically attempted to show you that dialectical thought stands in contradiction to the notion of any absolute first, we can concretize that epistemological insight specifically in relation to this apparently self-evident demand, which we naively accept in our own attempts to know, unless of course we have been infected by philosophy. For what is said to be either sensuously or intellectually given to me with absolute clarity in kind of self-givenness and with absolute distinctness and absolute distinction from anything else effectively amounts to an absolutely ultimate point of reference, something behind or beyond which we cannot go. Because its self-evident character, this is the very meaning of self-evidence, consists precisely in the fact that no such further recourse is required. For any such recourse would also have to appeal in turn to cases of self-evidence. There is no other criterion of truth, and you have here therefore reached an absolute foundation, as traditional logic would assure you, beyond which you cannot possibly go. Now dialectic puts this claim into question, yet dialectic does not put it into question, and this is entirely characteristic of dialectical thinking. By demanding as you might maliciously be tempted to imagine, that we think in an unclear and confused way instead of thinking clair et distinct. I will not deny that there are practitioners of dialectic whose thought sometimes turns out like this, but you can believe me when I say that the task of dialectical logic is certainly not to encourage or to produce such thinking. Rather, we can perhaps best express the point this way. Only if we first take the Cartesian demand with extraordinary seriousness and observe it with extraordinary strictness can we come to realize that it does not possess that absolutely binding character which it ascribes to itself. And this would actually be the dialectical path to take. The dialectical understanding of an object would be distinguished from a more primitive approach by 
taking a closer look at things as the people I am happy to belong to like to put it or by staring intensely at the object I would almost like to say until it becomes clear that no such thing as that absolute clarity which Descartes expects of the object is ever actually given. You will find, therefore, if you appeal to some pure sensuous certainty on the part of consciousness, a certainty from which all future or all further knowledge depends, and upon which you then try and build up the world of things, that this very givenness in accordance with its own meaning and character requires something like sense organs. Thus, you cannot possibly grasp the concept of optical perception, which traditional theory of knowledge postulates as the immediately given, as a form of immediate givenness, if this is separated from the organic constitution of the eye and everything that is connected with it. You cannot conceive of anything visual unless the relationship to the eye, and thus to the body and our sense organs, is also involved in this visual character as a kind of immediate knowing. On the other hand, the theory of knowledge tells us, you must first determine the character of the body as a functioning complex, as a regular law-governed condition for any possible sensuous perception. You will find, therefore, when you really try to hold fast at this point purely to the sensuously given as the ultimate ground of justification, that it is already mediated by what it is supposed to give rise to in the first place. And likewise, in turn, of course, you cannot speak of sense organs, without this moment of primary sensuous givenness. Thus, the moments which are involved here, even in this elementary example, do not stand in a relationship of something primary and something secondary. Rather, they stand in a reciprocally conditioning kind of relationship. And if we wish to express the truth about sensuous knowledge here, we would not assert either that sensuous knowledge is knowledge through the eye, or that sensuous knowledge is primarily a sensation of color. Rather, the truth would involve revealing, would first only properly be expressed by revealing, the interaction and entwinement of relations that is at work here. But once you reach this point, you will have to conclude that the demand for clara a distincta perceptio is itself dissolved as soon as it is strictly observed. During the last session, in attempting to contrast dialectic and positivism, I said to you that dialectic also contains a positivist element within itself, namely the micrological element, that is to say, the moment through which it immerses itself in the smallest details. And here, perhaps, in relation to this model which I have just mentioned, you may be able to see a little more precisely what I am trying to get at. For if we abandon ourselves to what is individually given, if we obstinately stay with the given until it gives itself up entirely to our gaze, then it ceases to be such a static and ultimate given and reveals itself as a dynamic process of becoming, as I have just tried to show with the example of the reciprocal production of moments in the case of sensuous givenness and the corresponding sense organ. This is where the dogmatic element of Descartes lies, as you can discover through these reflections, and I believe this is the real criticism of his rules, although it can only be developed in the first place by following these rules through. The dogmatic element which underlies the Cartesian conception, even though this conception strikes us as self-evident, is the way that the objects of our knowledge, or even truth itself, come to assume in themselves the form we bring to them through the method, namely through the demand that we should be able to know everything in a clear and distinct manner. The rule that only what we clearly and distinctly know is true for us is indeed required to preserve our knowledge from error and confusion. But this rule does not itself possess an ontological meaning, as such philosophers always assume. That is to say, it does not say anything about whether the very matter that we know clara a distincta is something that is unambiguous in itself, or something that is clearly and absolutely distinguished from everything else. Once you have brought out this moment, namely that the object in itself, if I only look upon it properly, is, in, is intrinsically dynamic, and that what seems rigid, if I only attend to it long enough, begins in a certain sense to teem like something beneath a microscope. It also follows from this that its distinction and differentiation from other adjoining and related objects, which is required by the postulate of distinctness, 
is by no means as simple as this has seemed for traditional thought to be. <clears throat> Rather, insofar as the object reveals itself beneath the gaze of knowledge in its functional and dynamic character, it transpires that the object is not just the same as itself, that it is always also something more and other than itself, is already a relation to what is other, and thus, while it is indeed distinct from other things, it is, however, not absolutely distinct from them. Now the error which is involved in the Cartesian rule is this. The rule tacitly treats the order of concepts traditionally demanded by extensional logic, the classificatory concepts which tell us that this is this and that is that, as if it were really the order which knowledge itself must essentially address. Thus, while it is true that without this method we, could f we would fall victim to chaos and confusion, we must nonetheless drive this method in turn to the point where we approach the object itself, so that thought may do justice to the matter in question rather than simply to a self-sufficient form of order. One could actually say that dialectic as such is an approach which enables us to distrust the, the tendency, or which should arm us against the tendency to conflate the order that we impose upon the object for the sake of our own peace of mind with the character of the matter itself. An approach which should encourage us to confront this order with the object in an insistent fashion until we arrive at a form of knowledge where our own subjective forms of knowing may genuinely concur with the essence of the matter itself. At this point you will ask, how then are we actually supposed to think? I believe you will not expect me to present you with some kind of anti-Cartesian discours de la méthode and tell, and tell you what the correct way of thinking should look like. Any such attempt, as I think should be obvious by now, would itself simply stand under the sign of that superstitious belief in some uniquely <coughs> hiccup, sorry, uniquely saving and beneficent method which we specifically wish to dispel through the reflections we are pursuing right now. But we are, of course, not entirely defenseless with regard to the objections which are typically raised against a kind of thinking which does not immediately submit to the diktat of these powerful ordering schemata. For we also recognize a demand for unity with regard to theoretical experience, and the path which leads to knowledge is neither that of capricious insights nor that of some abstract coherence in the organization of individual moments. Rather, we are talking about the unity involved in the development of theory. We can perhaps elucidate this best by indicating how even thinking itself is not actually a tabula rasa, i.e. that thinking is not something that we bring to the matter in some ultimate or merely general way, that it is not indeed, as people like to say, pure in character. For in such purity, thinking is first perverted precisely by the demands of a method which is supposed to be entirely independent of its subject matter and which first undertakes to remove all substantive moments from the instrument methodically employed. But thinking itself, the manner in which fact we concretely think as living human beings, is actually by no means separated off in this way, but is rather something entwined with the whole process of our knowledge or of our experience. And I would say, if I presume to offer you any positive instruction here about what one should think, that thinking which genuinely comprehends things in contrast with one that merely orders and classifies them is a kind of thinking that measures itself against the living experience which we have with objects. It is a thinking which acknowledges the moment of conceptual order, which it must naturally retain, for I cannot indeed think without concepts but continually confronts that moment of conceptual ordering with the living experience that I actually have. And out of the tension between both those moments, or both these moments, between conceptual order and that pre-conceptual experience from which concepts themselves have also nonetheless always sprung, such thinking in a process of constant reflection upon both the matter and thought itself eventually leads us out beyond a thinking which simply subsumes things beneath its grasp in a merely external fashion. This is the approach which would actually have to counter this Cartesian postulate. Some of these issues may become even clearer to you if we consider his second postulate, 
The second rule instructs us to divide up each of the difficulties which I examined into as many parts as possible, and as seemed requisite in order that it might be resolved in the best manner possible. In the first place, I would draw your attention to the quite everyday experience that the way in which we actually resolve difficulties does not invariably lie in referring what is difficult back to what appears simple. Basically, this idea already betrays something of that hatred with regard to the differentiated, to the all too complicated, which has accompanied Western subjectivism and rationalism like a shadow in a rather remarkable manner. The more the world becomes rational, the less I am really allowed, in a sense, to think about in the process. That is to say, everything must now ultimately be reduced to wholly simple, wholly thoughtless, wholly incomprehensible elements, although such a demand completely forgets that, if all that remains is really just what is most simple and most elementary, the object itself, whose complexity is what I wish to understand in the first place, has already slipped through my fingers, so that I have then actually failed the object, that I am now left with nothing but the trivialties into which I have broken down the object. On the other hand, that which actually attracts my attention as a potential object of knowledge, that to which such knowledge is actually addressed, that which constitutes the salt of the object, has already been removed in the way, in this way, and is actually no longer to be found. Of course, it is also true that I cannot manage without any analysis into more elementary aspects. Indeed, I have already talked to you in some detail about the dialectic of whole and part, and wherever I am confronted by some whole in its mere immediacy, without further articulation, I cannot simply rest content with this whole. What I have specifically attempted to grasp with the concept of micrological thinking, namely the persistent attention to a given object, already implies in a certain fashion that the wholeness with which an object of knowledge is presented to me is itself resolved into elements, and the movement into which what is alleged to be clearly and distinctly given is resolved, is resolved lies precisely in this, that the whole in question shows itself to consist of parts, though not simply as a mere sum of parts to which it might be reduced, but rather, and this is decisive here, in such a way that these parts themselves constitute a reciprocal relationship and stand in a dynamic relation to one another, so that the whole can no more be grasped by simply adducing the parts than it can be simply acknowledging and resting content with the undifferentiated whole itself rather than analyzing it with regard to its individual features. Here you can see particularly clearly that it is problematic to transfer the ideals of natural science to the realm of philosophy, because in this respect, the latter, and I would like to put this somewhat cautiously, seems to lag far behind the natural sciences themselves. And I should... I lost my spot. And I should also like at least to venture the thought here that the difficulties of mutual comprehension that beset philosophy and the thought developed by the natural sciences, a difficulty which appears to have become insurmountable precisely since Hegel, is connected with the fact that the philosophical reflection which the natural sciences have devoted to themselves does not actually do full justice to what the natural sciences do. That is to say, the natural sciences, since the time of Hegel, have not attained the requisite level of reflection for natural philosophy, or what we now describe as such generally amounts to little more than an abstract presentation of the rules and procedures involved in the thinking of the natural sciences, whereas the real task would precisely be to comprehend and explore these modes of procedure themselves. A rule like this Cartesian one which requires us to analyze everything into its elements derives of course from the realm of the mathematical natural sciences. That is to say, it is a rule which is essentially connected with the analytical treatment of conic sections, which seeks to express them in terms of equations, and thus ultimately to reduce them to their constituent elements. But if, it, but if I have rightly estimated the character of the natural sciences here, then they are by no means so ontologically convinced that everything complex and complicated must be capable in itself of being reduced to simple elements. Rather, natural science regards that very process of analysis into constituent elements, 
and on which, of course, it relies only as a model, that is to say, only as an attempt to secure the object in question within the ordering categories of consciousness, without thereby claiming that this simple and elementary dimension is itself simply identical with the essence of the matter. The philosophers, on the other hand, who are always concerned, as we know, with the essence of things, proceed as if the ordering concepts which the natural sciences have to employ were already in themselves an intrinsic order of things. That is to say, they proceed as if the whole were simply composed of parts, whereas in truth the whole and the parts reciprocally produce one another in the manner which I have tried to present to you in some detail. All I have been trying to do in the course of these remarks is to show you that the rather wide-ranging reflections about the relationship between the whole and the parts which we have pursued in the context of dialectical logic do have certain consequences, that they are not simply philosophical speculations. On the contrary, they imply something for the method of actual knowledge, namely that this apparently self-evident demand for the reduction of what is complex into its constituent parts does not possess the universal relevance or absolutely normative character which is ascribed to it in Cartesian philosophy, for example, in that in order to grasp these parts, their own dynamic and reciprocal relationship must equally be taken into account. And this gives me an opportunity to remind you here of a dialectical moment which we may have somewhat neglected until now, but which will afford you a rather better idea of the particular relevance which dialectical thought should possess, not as some sort of abstract philosophical system, but rather in the context of living knowledge itself. For it is characteristic of dialectic, I would like to say, that it does not ultimately recognize the separation of philosophy from the particular sciences. It belongs to the defensive posture which philosophy has felt driven to adopt through the development of science over the last couple of centuries, that philosophy has come to believe that it must assert itself as a realm which is beyond and independent of the sciences. Philosophy has found itself remarkably impoverished as a consequence, as we can so emphatically see today from that metaphysics of being which ultimately ends up in mere tautology, but this also really reveals a kind of impotence of philosophy with regard to knowledge, something which must certainly be overcome if philosophy is to present itself actually and seriously as more than a mere Sunday metaphysics or a mere taxonomic system of some sort. If a philosophy really is one, this must mean that the philosophical motivations themselves enter into the material dimension of substantive cognition instead of simply surrendering the material knowledge of things to the individual sciences, or even to the treatment of the formal sciences. And if I am critical about the role of definition in philosophy, that cannot mean that speaking as a philosopher in my lecture from four till five, I assure myself that definition is indeed a problematic matter, but then go into the law seminar, for example, and simply define the concepts which are employed there, whatever they may be. For what is required, on the contrary, is that knowledge regarding the relationship between thought and thing, or regarding the problem of definition itself, that all of these matters must really also be introduced in the, into the cognitive procedures of the individual sciences. And this is to say that philosophy, to say that dialectic, if it is to have any genuine sense at all, is by no means innocuous, is not a matter of mere philosophy which is simply occupied with itself. On the contrary, the reflection to which philosophy exposes our so-called natural consciousness, that is to say, our, natural, our unnatural and conventional consciousness, also intrinsically requires that we rethink in a fundamental sense its own attitude and response to the knowledge preferred by the individual sciences, and that, as ones who reflect upon our own work, we now also bring the knowledge derived from philosophical reflection to bear upon such particular forms of knowledge. And I would say that this, that this movement, this critical movement of thought is specifically what the individual researcher or investigator can really learn in the first place from the practice of dialectic. And this is the key thing here.